Okay, I think we're going to start. Well, um, I'm really excited that Jonathan Metzel is here today. And I don't even think Jonathan remembers, but this is our 25th anniversary, I think. I, yeah, that <laughs> I hate to say it. <laughs> it's really, I, um, so I first met Jonathan when I just finished the Robert Johnson Clinical Scholars Program, and Jonathan was coming through to interview. And we desperately wanted him to come here, and instead, he didn't. <laughs> I keep coming back there. Um, but <laughs> what I and I love when it, Jonathan comes here because his career and work so nicely exemplifies um, how important it is to train as both a physician and as a social scientist. And um, um, he would just said that he was a card-carrying sociologist, and I actually thought he was a card-carrying historian because I'm a historian and we need more historians. And I'm a historian. And, and, but the truth of the matter is, is that his work defies categorization, um, and yeah, he employs methods from history, sociology, anthropology, and health services research, and in part because of his methodologic flexibility, but also because he's so smart. He's spent his career asking the really fundamental questions, at least from my perspective as a practicing psychiatrist, that are really critical questions, I think, to ask about you know, what it means um, to be a psychiatrist, the nature of psychiatric therapeutics, how we categorize patients, um, the ways in which medical knowledge are embedded and shaped within a larger kind of though often, as Jonathan often points out, invisible sociocultural structures. And so as I was thinking about Jonathan coming today and just trying to map out in my mind the kinds of work he's done, he, I, I think there's sort of four different areas that he's contributed really quite enormously to and in really important ways. Um, one has to do with looking at the intersection of race, politics, and schizophrenia. And then and it, he's been pioneering the notion of structural competency with Helena Hansen and um, Philippe Bourgeois has also been quite involved in that, um, who's here. Um, and he's look, you know, really interrogating the health implications of inequality and going, I think, one step beyond um, how we kind of think of social determinants of health, but asking a more fundamental question about what creates those determinants. Um, and then he's done really important work around visual cultures of pharmaceutical advertising. And then what he's going to talk about today is mental illness, racism, and U.S. gun culture, um, I think. Am I right? Yeah. Nope. <laughs> Something, though. <Yeah. laughs> we'll see. Um, <laughs> but what's also really great about Jonathan is he's a public intellectual. He's um, been on MSNBC for years, um, and then he um, also uh, – just recently, Bill Maher, um, uh, Morning Joe, um, CNN. So it's really great having a, a, an important intellectual being able to communicate findings to the larger public. Um, Jonathan is currently at Vanderbilt. He's been there since 2011. He's the Frederick D. Rentzler the second endowed professor um, in sociology. Um, and he also is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and importantly, directs the Center for Medicine, Health, and Society. He received his bachelor's and MD at the University of Missouri, and um, then went to Stanford to do a psychiatry residency. And in the midst of his residency, got a master's in American poetry, and did his, dis um, his um, thesis on the poetics of mental illness. And then as, a, and then, he went as an RWJ scholar, went to Michigan instead of here, as I mentioned, and um, got his PhD in American culture. And um, then after finishing his PhD in the Clinical Scholars Program, was professor at the University of Michigan from 2001 to 2011. Um, and um, there he was professor of women's studies and psychiatry. And his publications, as I've alluded to, have been you know, ranging from um, Lancet to the American Journal of Public Health. And then he's written three really important books that I hope everyone reads. Um, the first one is um, entitled um, Prozac on the Couch, Prescribing Gender in the Era of Wonder Drugs, and that was published by Duke in 2003. Protest Psychosis, which came out in 2010, 
which is how schizophrenia became a black disease. And then his third book, which just came out, I think, in March, um, and is really has a wonderful title, as well as being a wonderful book, and an important book, especially given the current um, political climate, is Dying of Whiteness, How the Politics of Racial Resentment is Killing America's Heartland. And I think that's what you're talking about. Thank you so much. It's so great to be here. And I just first wanted to thank everybody who brought about this visit, uh, Joel and Jonathan and Sophie in the back hiding there. And uh, it's just been, it's been a really great process of putting together this visit and thinking about talking to different kinds of audiences. We had an amazing night last night uh, doing kind of a book club with residents. And I was so in inspired, really, to see so many people doing such great, important ground level work that combines really the advances of psychiatry and mental illness and medicine with important uh, pressing social issues, which I have to say, in spite of what you might be reading in the Wall Street Journal these days, is I think a very important avenue for medical practitioners uh, to be engaging in. And so thank you everybody, uh, first of all, and thank you Joel for that lovely introduction. I will be talking uh, about my book today, the book that just uh, came out uh, last spring, which has a little bit about guns and healthcare and other kinds of stuff and also the politics of race. And then later today uh, at uh, 5.30, 5.30, we're doing a panel on guns. If people want to hear more specifically about guns, please come to the panel later. But it's really great also to be here, first of all, because it's beautiful and everybody's so nice and happy. Um, and second, uh, because um, I've had a kind of interesting past couple of months where I haven't really been talking to people. Um, I've been talking to people a little bit, but really I've just been going on this crazy media whirlwind. It, it was interesting to write a book called Dying of Whiteness because when it first came out, my publisher was like, we don't know. Maybe we'll print 2,000 2, copies or something like that. We're not sure, whatever. And it just became this crazy whirlwind of different things happening where the minute the book came out, that morning I went on the Morning Joe show, and then it was like this incredible cascade of different things happening with media and interviews and all these kind of things, which I didn't see coming and they didn't see coming. And it also happened that the book got caught up in all of these important political conversations about race and identity. And I could categorize these in two ways. On one hand, <coughs> there were a lot of uh, arguments basically that I was being an anti-right white racist because of course I wrote this book, Dying of Whiteness. And what would it be you know, to do that except for blaming Trump for killing white people? Um, now that is not actually my argument at all, but that kind of got taken up by the conservative media. And for people who maybe saw that led to um, neo-Nazis uh, protesting a talk I gave at Politics and Prose in DC, which was this crazy event where I was giving a talk much like this one, but in from the back about middle of the talk came a bunch of guys with bullhorns and very particular, um, they, they do have this very particular haircut, which I should not make fun of anybody's haircut. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, but you know they took they commandeered the talk and they did all this stuff and it went viral and all this kind of stuff and I mean it was terrifying for a moment but then the book went to number eight on Amazon and I called my dad my dad's a Holocaust survivor and I'm like dad finally the Nazis gave us something back you know <laughs> uh, which was pretty interesting so it was a pretty interesting experience I have to say but I have to say that it, the funny thing is even though I have whiteness in my title it, I wasn't making this exact argument that was kind of what they thought I was saying. Um, I also got a lot of liberal uh, press, which I'm very happy for, and people were basically saying, oh, these dumb white people, they're so dumb, they're voting against their own self-interest, so stuff like that. And that, even though, again, I'm happy any press is good press, as I'm learning um, for the most part, um, but that's not my argument either. That, w that was not what I was trying to say either. Um, so let me just tell you, what, first of all, what my argument is in the book, and I'll tell you where it came from. Uh, this is really a project that started when I moved, as Joel just said, to, to, to Nashville. I'd been really pretty much an East Coast person. I mean, I, I grew up in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, but then I'd lived in New York and here at Stanford and then at Michigan. And I got recruited to, to Vanderbilt in 2011 to start this Center for Medicine, Health, and Society. And it was a pretty interesting time to move to Tennessee, a state that used to be a kind of democratic state. You can think about like Al Gore and other people being politicians there. And then all of a sudden, it becomes this very, very red state. And 2011 was a pretty interesting year to move there um, for a number of reasons, both for, uh, for me personally, but also because there was this thing coming down the pike called the Affordable Care Act. Now, for people who remember, 
way back in history. I say that because I teach undergrads, and 2011 is a long time ago for, for many of them. Um, but in 2011, this, there, it was this interesting moment, right, where um, the, the Affordable Care Act had been passed, uh, uh, passed by Congress, passed by the Senate, uh, and then there was a big Supreme Court bill, basically, uh, that, that said, okay, we're gonna say that the Affordable Care Act is the law of the land, that was Roberts' deciding vote, um, but they allowed for a certain kind of, um, you know, a, a little bit of a hitch in the process, which was that people thought the Affordable Care Act was gonna uh, allow um, um, Medicaid expansion for everybody, but it turned out that only states that wanted the Medicaid expansion, you had to vote in politicians who were gonna do the Medicaid expansion. And so there was this debate about what's the role of the Affordable Care Act gonna be? Are states gonna invent, you know, a, a, a basically expand their markets, allow for insurance markets? Is the Affordable Care Act gonna become the law of a state or is the state gonna block it? And so it was a very interesting and heady time. And I think that the Affordable Care Act is particularly important in a place like Tennessee because of the state's particular history with, um, with health insurance itself. So Tennessee is a state that some people might know is the home to, I think it's like eight out of 10 um, cents on every dollar for health insurance goes through Tennessee because we're the home of, for example, HCA Holdings and other kinds of health insurance companies. They're all based in Tennessee, many of them based in Nashville. And Tennessee, because of that reason, has a history of trying to insure most of its population. So it's weird that on one hand, all these health insurance companies are in Tennessee. And on the other hand, um, people it had very low rates of health insurance. And so people got together in the 1990s and basically said, how can we have it? That we're exporting health insurance for the rest of the country, but our state has such poor health insurance. And they got together and they devised really an innovative program in the 1990s called TenCare, and the idea of TenCare basically was a public-private partnership, the first of its kind, in which states and state organizations would get together with private health insurers and create a particular kind of program that would aim to insure all Tennesseans and really create this vast healthcare network in Tennessee. Now, I'll tell you that that was an incredibly noble goal. It took a lot of polit political movering, maneuvering at the time, and it was a remarkable success in the beginning, um, by uh, the mid-1990s, 1997, 1998, a state that had very low health insurance all of a sudden went to 94% coverage in the entire state. So all of a sudden, out of nowhere, 94% of people in the state of Tennessee were, were insured. This is a remarkable story. And it became this southern oasis. That's what people called it. Tennessee became a southern oasis for health insurance. And it became so much so that other states started to say in the South, gosh, maybe the South isn't the place where we're gonna have these really poor health outcomes. Instead, let's invent, a, let's in adopt a system very similar to TenCare. So other states, even like Mississippi and Alabama that have very poor health outcomes, started to think, well, gosh, maybe this TenCare model of public-private partnership can be something that we can adopt ourselves. Now, there's a sad ending to this particular part of the story, which is that if you can just imagine a state that had almost no health insurance coverage for most people, and then all of a sudden, out of the blue, everybody gets health insurance, what's gonna happen when people come to the doctor? And what happens is that it's not like people are coming in for their high school checkup to play on the soccer team or something like that. Um, it's that people are coming in, having been untreated for 20 years with hypertension or diabetes or very expensive illnesses, and so what happened was, the, the system just became incredibly, incredibly expensive. And uh, over time, what happened was it became a drag on the system to the point where, over time, the entire system failed. So even though there was this very noble attempt, it got to the point, there was an article in the New York Times about five or six years ago, where they started throwing people off the rolls, they started closing clinics because of this dramatic increased cost. And people who were even on the rolls would have to take off a week of work and just call and call and call repeatedly just to try to get through to get some kind of coverage. So Tennessee is important on one hand because of, uh, for the Affordable Care Act because of that. And Tennessee is also important because, uh, just to use a kind of complex legal medical term, we have really crappy health outcomes in our state, uh, really bad. And so if you just look at different variables about health, you know, we've got increasing obesity, we've got increasing heroin overdose, chronic disease, morbidity and mortality in kids, and even the big cities in Tennessee around the time that the Affordable Care Act came out had had rising rates of uninsurance. And so what had happened in the years before, before the Affordable Care Act came 
was kind of a health disaster. Very low insurance rates, rising costs, and rising rates of different risk factors like obesity and, and factors like that. And so you would think in an ideal world that when this thing came down the pike called the Affordable Care Act, people would have been excited about it. I'm just, I'm not gonna go on too long even though I could talk about it forever about the Affordable Care Act, but just looking at some of the things that the bill was designed to do in 2010 when people were really talking about it. Now I realize the Affordable Care Act now is a very complicated political hot potato, but I often think about the Affordable Care Act as like, you know, your very first iPhone or Atari Pong or something like that, like a technology that was in its first iteration but was going to be improved over time. So it wasn't the end stage of what it was gonna be, but even when it first came out, look at what it was trying to do. Free preventative care. Now think about how cool that would be in Tennessee, right? Preventative care because people were coming into the doctor super sick, but if you can intervene, you know, proximally, not distally, that's gonna be great for the system. Prevention and public health programs to keep people healthy in the community. Well, God, that's great for a place like Tennessee because as you just saw, we've got rising rates of obesity and cardiovascular disease, diabetes. And importantly, consumer protections and particularly for uh, low-income fa families. And why is that important? That's important because, because of this 10 care thing, what they saw is they couldn't afford the system and people started getting thrown off the rolls, right? So all of a sudden there's nobody on the rolls um, and it's too expensive. So just think about it. Here's a state where really if you think about what the Affordable Care Act was designed to do, it really was almost like mana from heaven for people from Tennessee, right? It was this idea basically that all of the exact problems that Tennessee had, too much cost, trying to insure all the people but they couldn't do it, really bad preventative care, here comes the Affordable Care Act and it's almost literally designed for a state like Tennessee to intervene and to, re res to kind of turn things around. Now, unfortunately, that's not exactly what happened in the state of Tennessee. Unfortunately, what really happened was that people said, you know, US, get out of my blah, blah, blah. And so there were things like the Obama witch care poster and get your hands off my health care. It's unconstitutional, et cetera. So people really, really weren't having it. So here's the time where I'm coming to Tennessee, right? It's 2011. And what we started to do were a series of focus groups. And a co a, uh, some colleagues of mine and I did focus groups in Tennessee. And we did focus groups across the economic spectrum. We did some in very wealthy communities. We did some in middle income uh, working communities. But the, the, a, a few of the responses I'm gonna show you now actually came from the focus groups that we did in very low income housing uh, projects around Nashville and kind of rural areas around Nashville. Now, these, these housing projects are very important uh, for a variety of reasons. One is just, <clears throat> It's really hard to be poor anywhere, but it's particularly hard to be poor in the South. The South is a place where there's really no safety net. And so in order to um, stay alive in a particular way, um, you really had to be very brave, very ambitious, because the chance of falling through the cracks was remarkably, remarkably high. And what we did in these, in these housing communities was we would kind of advertise, we put up signs and we basically said, come talk to us, we'll give you 15 bucks and a free dinner, which was a, you know, a very good incentive for, for a lot of people there. And we convened different kinds of groups. We convened groups with white men and African-American men divided by self-identified race. And we talked to men like this. Now these aren't exactly the men because of HIPAA. These are stock photos that I took from the internet. But I will say they are representative of the kinds of men that we were talking about, men who were down on their luck and men who were very, very medically ill very often. So people would come to these groups, um, you know, with oxygen masks, or I, I was telling the group last night, one guy came with a walker and he was 34 years old. And I said, why do you have a walker? And it turned out his liver failure was so bad, his inflamed liver that he actually couldn't move because it was too painful. So really, really serious medical illness. And the idea was that we were gonna talk to people about the Affordable Care Act. And the kind of basic idea of this was that Gosh, you could be a Republican, a Democrat, a Libertarian, a Raelian, whatever your ideology is, but in your moment of direct need, when you're in your most kind of urgent moment of medical need, I, I guess the thought was, were people willing to throw politics out the window when they were in, their, in these profound crisis moments in their own lives? And so we would ask people about the Affordable Care Act, and the groups were pretty uh, remarkable. Um, first, we'd ask people about themselves, and we heard these stories of remarkable bravery, again, just the kinds of things that people needed to do to stay alive, to gain enough income to get by the system. 
But what we would do is we would create, we would kind of structure the focus groups exactly the same way in each case. Um, what we would do is for the first 10, 15, 20 minutes, we would ask people, so what do you do to stay healthy? What does health mean to you? What kind of daily practices do you do just to maintain your own health? And it's, it was funny because we saw very similar responses from the white and African-American men that we spoke to. Everybody would basically say, yeah, you know, I try to go be on a good diet, but then McDonald's has the sale like 99 cents on the McRib, and I just can't walk by the McDonald's, or I want to exercise, but, you know, it's too stressful or something like that. Like, when you ask people, what do you do to stay healthy, it's often a tension between what I want to do and your own diet. So that was kind of a, a similar story. And about 15, 20 minutes into the group, we would ask people, okay, now there's this thing called the Affordable Care Act coming down the pike. Can you tell us um, who benefits from health care reform? We didn't call it Obamacare. We didn't even call it the Affordable Care Act. We would just ask the question, who benefits from health care reform? Now, that's kind of a tricky question, right? Because it's not about you at that point. It's about the system. And what we saw here were really remarkable differences according to race between the two groups. So when we asked African-American men who benefits from health care reform, they would give us answers like this. I think society does. I think society that keeps people having insurance, it keeps the cost down for everyone. I think because people are healthy because of checkups like that. So I think everyone, everyone benefits. I think as a society, we all do by having people insured. Someone has to protect the citizenship not just black people, but protect us as a country, you know. So these are remarkable answers, I think. Again, these are men that are poor and sick. Um, and they're basically saying, we don't want just these benefits for our own group. We want benefits because it raises the boat of the country as a whole. Now, that's important for a couple of reasons. One, of course, is that that's how health insurance works, right? You want to have the, as many people as possible built in, you know, participating in the particular system. And so it's just interesting that, that, you know, that they were giving a sense of the understanding how health insurance works. And they were also giving, I think, a very selfless answer that says, we don't want just these benefits for us. We want these benefits for everybody. Now, I can tell you, um, it was a pretty different story when we talked to white men. And we would just ask that question, who benefits from health care reform? And we'd hear stuff like this. I'm 53, and I've already had two heart attacks. Um, I fat, I, sm I smoke, my diet sucks. I spend 12 hours a day flipping burgers and come back to my room and eat junk food and watch TV. I'm a ticking time bomb. I've got high blood pressure, just like my dad, and he died when he was young. And so I'd be like, yeah, and who benefits from health care reform? And they'd, he'd be like, I ain't supporting Obamacare, no way, no how. I ain't signing up for it neither. And I'd be like, well, why is that? Ain't no way I want my tax dollars going to a quote I heard a million times in these groups. Ain't no way I want my tax dollars going to help Mexicans or welfare queens. Now, this was a story I heard again and again in many different ways. Um, people basically said a lot of those people use Obamacare. They're using it up. They're not sick. They go to two or three doctors. They eat the shit out of it, and then it's not, the, it's not there when you get there. Um, there's a lot of people that use welfare department, and I wouldn't even ask about welfare, and quit having children. They're having 10 or 12 kids. Um, they're using it up. It's about time something happened. It's not going to be any there anymore if they use it up. Or one of my favorite quotes, the worst thing that really pisses Americans off is that we are pocketing all the Mexicans, all the illegal mother, mother truckers, their houses, their cars, their food stamps, everything they want, we are paying for it. So I think you can get the kind of general sense of the kinds of answers that I heard uh, when talking to white men in this particular context. And it was basically a sense of we're not participating in Obamacare, even if it might help us, because it links to other factors that are, that are happening in the system. And so really this became the existential question of the book, which is what were these men dying of, these white poor men? And I really in the book answer this particular question in two different ways. On one hand, it was hard to overlook the fact that these men were dying Ill medical illness. There was nothing socially constructed about the fact that they were dying of COPD and liver failure, or cancer, or heart disease, addiction, despair. So if you want to see real medical illness, just go down to the South and just talk to poor people because that's really a place where untreated illness is in many ways at its most, most rampant. So on one hand, I wanted to be respectful of the fact that these were people who were making decisions in light of a very tough so socioeconomic circumstance. 
And at the other hand, it was also hard to overlook that these men were dying of a particular ideology. And if you just think about those quotes I just told you, there are strands of this ideology that, that, that came through. Part of the ideology told them that there were privileges that were due to white Americans. So you, that, one, that one response, people conflated we with Americans. And, and basically the fear was that there were just a limited number of resources that minor, minorities and immigrants were out to usurp these resources that we Americans are paying for it, which I think was, you know, I mean, there was this constant frame of we are paying for it, but I, I don't think a lot of the people I talked to were paying a ton of taxes, so we was a, a much broader term. Um, and of course, there was a lot of racism involved, and it all went into this idea of people not just rejecting the Affordable Care Act, but as they said, refusing to sign up for it, which is pretty remarkable when you think about very medically ill men in the South. And, I have to say, the ultimate tragedy of this story was that it wasn't just these men who were doing it. So if it was just these 12 men in a room who said racist stuff in the South, that's not very surprising. But unfortunately, it tied into a much bigger story, which is that the state of Tennessee voted in politicians who refused to expand Medicaid, right? We didn't create insurance marketplaces. We didn't do any of the things that made the Affordable Care Act functional. And so in that regard, this is a story of tensions in a room linking to the much bigger politics of the state. And the reason I think that political story is important is because there was a state right next to us called Kentucky, actually above us, um, that took a different path, at least for about four or five years. Kentucky did adopt the Affordable Care Act. Um, it did create a Medicaid expansion. It did create for a while a competitive marketplace with more than one insurer. And what happened was, there, that allowed for a comparison. And so what I did in the book is I just started not just doing focus groups, but adding up what happened to health outcomes between Kentucky and Tennessee. And the story, unfortunately, is a pretty tragic one. Um, on one hand, if your goal was to um, worsen the health care, the livelihood, the longevity of people of color, I have to say what Tennessee did was very effective. Um, these are two graphs that showed the percentage of uninsured, uh, Hispanic is the term that's used on the, on the census, but Latino uh, populations. And basically what you can see is that Kentucky, because it adopted the Affordable Care Act, had dramatic improvements in rates of uninsurance, but Tennessee, which didn't do it, really kind of flatlined, and it's the same for African Americans. Here's Kentucky. Black Americans dramatically fell off of the uninsured rolls and all of a sudden became insured, but Tennessee saw none of those gains. And so on one hand, if your goal was to worsen the lot of people of color, blocking Affordable Care Act was a very effective way to do it. The only problem was that Tennessee is a state that's about 85% white, and so unfortunately, the data also showed that the people who were suffering the greatest brunt of these policies were actually white Americans. And I have tons of data in the book that kind of helps make this point. Percentage of adult without a routine doctor visits in the, in the past year. So it turned out that in Kentucky, there was a dramatic fall in people who didn't see the doctor, but Tennessee, all of a sudden, nobody went to see the doctor. It's exactly falling back into the same patterns. The same thing about people foregoing medical care because of the cost. It turned out that in Kentucky, people stopped foregoing medical care because all of a sudden people could afford it. I mean, everything that's related, there were fewer medical bankruptcies, uh, there were fewer urgent emergency room visits. All these things that you care about about cost got much better in Kentucky and got worse in Tennessee. And so here's a story about two states that are right next to each other. And ultimately in the book, I added it up. The book's called Dying of Whiteness. And part of the reason it's called Dying of Whiteness is I just added up what did it cost Tennessee to block the Affordable Care Act, and it turned out it was actually not that hard to aggregate it out. And it turned out in the book that I found out in the four years after they blocked the Affordable Care Act, it ultimately cost every Tennessean, if you aggregated it, about three weeks of lifespan. Now that's not true, of course, for everybody. Some rich people didn't do badly and some poor people did much worse. But if you aggregated it out, it was kind of like, what's three weeks of your life worth? Because that was the cost of blocking a system that they thought benefited Mexicans and welfare queens. So 
that was kind of my jumping off point for this particular book. And really, if you think about it, if you know kind of American racial history, it's not that surprising that people in Tennessee, right, would have that particular attitude. Uh, we have, live in a country where we've been asking about why is it that white Americans are making decisions that are bad for their own health because of race for a very long time. And I think really the champion of that argument was Du Bois, right, for people who know his famous work after Reconstruction. Du Bois wrote this remarkable book about the period after the Civil War. And in that book, he basically says, gosh, here are two groups that are getting screwed over by elites. There are very poor white people. Um, they did not own plantations. They did not have anything to fight for except for being soldiers fighting for the South. And now after the Civil War, they don't have anything. They have terrible wages. They are not landowners. They have no rights whatsoever. And another group that's really getting screwed over in the South are newly freed slaves, black people, because of course they were just slaves. So of course they don't have any property either. And Du Bois said, why is it that black Americans and white Americans don't join forces? Because if they did that, they could extract all of these, you know, they could get better wages, they could get uh, land, they could do all these things. Why don't the black and white working communities join together? And what Du Bois said is the answer was something called the wage of whiteness, for people who have heard this term. Basically that society told white people that there was a wage, it wasn't a financial wage, it was a psychological wage, that what it meant to be white in society was the privilege that they had and it discouraged them from joining forces with people of color. So even back right after the Civil War, working class white people in the South were working uh, maybe for whiteness, but against their economic interests a a as well. And really, this idea of a wage of whiteness became the jumping off point for my research in the book, where I started to ask myself, what other issues beside healthcare are there in which people's identity of whiteness um, might be a place where they are, on one hand, identifying with a particular form of politics, but also doing so in exchange for their own longevity. And in the narrative of the book, I travel through, I think, three kind of red or purple states, uh, and I talk about three hot button political issues. I spend a lot of time in Missouri talking about guns and gun rights. I just mentioned I spent time in Tennessee talking about health care. And I spent a lot of time going to Kansas. Kansas was a state that basically had a very highly functioning education system. Then there was a Tea Party takeover of the state. And as I'll tell you just very quickly in a moment here, um, it really took away taxes and undermined the education system in the state. And I asked those questions, how was it that health and politics were at odds with each other? And really my main question was, what happens, what happens when I think the politics that undermine those answers in the room in Tennessee, basically anti-government, anti-immigrant, pro-gun, even though I didn't mention it here, those kind of politics, what happens when those set health policies in a particular state? So let me, before I finish up, just give you a couple other examples from my research. As I mentioned, I spent a lot of time in Missouri. It's where I grew up, so it was coming home in, in a particular way. Uh, Missouri is a pretty interesting state because Missouri had had a very long history of what I thought was kind of common sense gun laws. Missouri, um, for a long time, had a long tradition of hunting. A lot of people owned guns, but it was very hard to get a gun. You had to actually go be interviewed in person at a sheriff's office to make sure that you could get a permit. And then what happened in 2008 was a dramatic Tea Party NRA takeover of the state where they passed these sweeping expansion of gun rights and they did away really with every kind of regulation. So all of a sudden, you didn't need a permit. You didn't really need a background check. Anybody could go in. They also lowered the age of carry from 21 to 18. They allowed people to open carry in public and concealed carry in public. So Missouri is this very interesting state and something interesting happened after 2008. Of course, many, many more guns flooded into the state, but it wasn't everybody who went to buy the guns. So there was a dramatic increase in what are called white gun super owners. These are uh, white men, basically, who own 30 or more weapons, often 30 or more semi-automatic weapons. And there was a dramatic, dramatic increase in Missouri in what were called white gun super owners. So much of this rise in gun ownership was really driven by white men. And why is that important? Well, 
my book's about race, and so what I do in the book is I go through the racial history of just who gets to own a gun and who gets to carry a gun in a state like Missouri. Now, I don't have that much time today, so I'm not going to go into it in great depth. But I will just say that there's a 200-year history in the Midwest and South of who gets to own a gun and who gets to carry it in public. And if you go back even to pre-colonial times, who could carry a gun in public? Well, it was a white landowner. And then a white landowner bestowed the right to carry a weapon in public to their white servants, uh, their white uh, workers. And the reason they did that was to suppress potential revolts from, Af from Negroes, called it at the time, from uh, Indians. And so basically, if you got to carry a gun in the pre-colonial and colonial days, in a place like Missouri, you were almost certainly a white person. And that, that history goes all the way through um, the Civil War, Reconstruction, the Klan era, factors like that, where carrying a gun was a white privilege. And every time that African American people would basically say, hey, wait, the Second Amendment applies to us, these arguments were squelched very, very quickly. And what I did in Missouri was just look at how much that history was still alive. And so this idea that gun ownership was a white privilege coursed through all of these advertisements that I would see when I was down in Missouri in pro-gun magazines and things like that. Here's an ad for an AR-15, a semi-automatic weapon. And they basically told men to get their man card reissued. And they just say it right here. If, you, if you're a wimpy man and you don't have an AR-15, get your man card back. It's a world of rapidly defeating testosterone. The Bushmaster man card, which you get by getting an AR-15, confirms that you are a man's man, the last of a dying breed, with all of the rights and privileges duly afforded. So there's the word privilege right there. It's not even a, a, a big mystery about who's being marketed to. And I really saw this a lot, this idea of basically a citizen is somebody who gets to carry a gun, the re restores the balance of power. So very kind of racially coded language. And I heard this language a lot because in part of my research, I went to a bunch of open carry marches and NRA meetings. And I would go and just, like, this was a march where we went through um, downtown, l largely African-American part of St. Louis, and people would carry their guns and hold them up and basically say, it's my privilege, it's my right, so this very historically Latin terms. And at the same time, when African-American men would try to, is, you know, basically do the same thing across the South, and basically there were all these stories of people who had gun permits and just went into Walmart to, like, buy some coffee or pillows or something like that, they would be tackled or shot or worse. So there's this whole racial history. And when I went down to southern Missouri and talked to people, and I basically said, so why do you own a gun? These were the kind of stories that people told me. Now, um, for me, this was the most powerful part of the research. But people would basically say, it's our patriotism, it's our liberty, it's what Trump stands for and what crooked Hillary is trying to take away from us. So all this language that was coming right out of history. And then I just, again, just started to add up the data. There's also a bunch of qualitative stuff about interviews I did, which are really powerful and poignant, and the stories were really tragic. But at the numbers level, when I started to add up the data about just what happens, well, certainly when you have guns come into a state, it's no, it's no mystery that you see increasing rates of homicide. And so what happened, first of all, is that urban areas in Kansas City, uh, St. Louis, factors like uh, places like that, started to see rises in their rates of gun homicide. And it, it was dramatic, but not as dramatic as you would think. It was about 40 or 50 more homicides a year. But that raised Missouri up, up the ranks. But the silent story that wasn't being told in the, Missouri, in the media was that really the biggest rate of gun death was seen in suicide. So here's Missouri. Here are all other states that have bad gun laws, um, Texas and Florida. Here are states that have um, more uh, strict gun laws, um, Connecticut and New York. It turned out Missouri became number one in gun suicide. And when I started to break down the demographics of who was it that was suffering from gun suicide, don't even worry about this graph. I'll just tell you that it was 85 to 90 percent white men. So all of a sudden, two thirds of the gun death in the state is suicide, and 90 percent of that is the same men who are holding up their guns as symbols of white privilege. So all of a sudden, there's this tension between these symbols that are supposed to restore the balance of power and putting white men at risk to the point where they see de decreasing rates of, of longevity. And that was also true uh, when I divided white men. Here are white men. 
compare every other kind of men, you would think with the, you know, expanded gun laws that everybody could get a gun. So African American men, Asian American men, immigrant men, whatever. But it turned out that white men really set the curve. Um, and again, I just added up the data and I said, okay, how do we think about this in a particular way? And it turned out that on one hand, again, people thought that having more guns around was a great thing. But when I added up the data, it turned out that it made white men about 14.5 times more likely to die than they had been before all these guns, guns became available. And so this, this symbol of their power really started to cost them. I just did it through quality of life years. And it cost them um, 10,500 life years even in the first couple years after these guns became available. The final part of the book um, is in Kansas, and I, I, I want to finish up in about five minutes here, so we have a bit of time for Q&A. Um, but let me just say that it was a kind of different story in Kansas, but Kansas is a story that has a very, a state that has a very strong education system. It turns out that um, after the Brown versus Board of Education decision, Kansas really invested a lot in its public school system. And Kansas was number four or five in the country in terms of fourth and eighth grade reading and math. It had excellent um, high school dropout rate numbers compared to other states. And then they elected this guy, Sam Brownback, who's now in the Trump administration. And his goal was basically to eviscerate anything that had to do with the government. And so dramatic cuts to roads, bridges, and importantly, to schools. And I would go around and talk to parents. And I would basically say, gosh, you know, what's your feeling about schools being cut? And I talked to people whose kids were at the schools where these huge budget cuts were happening. And certainly, I heard a lot of people who were completely appalled about this. But I also heard stories that were reflective of the kinds of things I was hearing in Tennessee and in Missouri. I've heard that minority districts rent luxury party buses for football games, and they're basically wasting our taxpayer money. So this idea, this urban myth that poor, poor communities were wasting taxpayer money. And then I just started to add up the data, and it turned out that, man, if you start cutting education budgets the way they did in the state, it really has dramatic negative effects, and it certainly affects minority communities. Um, here's African-American students on the fourth grade math exam, and you can see that these numbers had been improving for years. When the tax went into effect in 2011, dramatic falls. Here are Latino students, uh, again, rises until 2011, and then the minute these tax cuts started to hit, it was like falling off a cliff. But again, the problem is Kansas is a state that's about 85% white. And so who had the worst outcomes from an aggregate level? Well, it turned out to be white Americans, right? Because all of a sudden, the many, many, many more white students who were in the system also saw dramatically worsening fourth and eighth grade reading tests. And also, they started to drop out of high school in rates that were much, much greater than other groups. So it turned out that this system that was supposed to be screwing over you know, black schools for party buses ended up boomeranging to really affect white students as well. And here are the numbers. There's all this data that basically dropping out of high school, um, it shortened your lifespan from about five to seven years because you know worse job, less ex access to health care, less education, things like that. So I just started adding it up, and it turned out in the first four years of, of the cuts, um, it was a, uh, like over 6,000 lost quality of life years. So this remarkable, remarkable effect. And I've got lots of graphs and data that I can go into about that. Um, and so just in conclusion, um, you know, really what I saw in these particular states was, I think, um, a return to a politics. It's not like it was invented by the Trump era or the GOP or the, or the Tea Party, um, but a return to a particular politics that told people that they were dying for a cause in a particular way, that there was this sense of whiteness, that whiteness needed to be made great again, that whiteness needed to be restored, um, some factor like that. And on one hand, I, I want to say that it was pretty powerful, right? I mean, again, I live in Tennessee. I have many friends who are Trump supporters, believe it or not, because I play a lot of sports. Um, I'm from Missouri, and you meet all different kinds of people when you live in a, in a state like that. And so it wasn't like I was going into some foreign country. And I want to say that, you know, I, I understood for people who weren't, like, uttering blatantly racist stuff, like the people who make it to my slides at a talk, um, that I do think that there was this sense of winning, right, that basically there was an assumption that these people were voting against their interests. Well, that assumes that I knew what their interests were. And I will say that over the course of my research, 
you know, things that people told me about, uh, you know, they weren't like dumb about what it meant to, um, you know, they didn't not know what the Affordable Care Act did. It's just like they would tell me things like, I don't want more government, I want small government, I believe in abortion, uh, and things like that. And so what happened was they really felt like they were part of a bigger thing. And I think it's important to recognize that when I would ask people, you know, what would it take to not vote for Trump? Or, you know, just funny little questions I would ask. And they would look at me like I was nuts because from their perspective, they were on the winning side. And they would tell me things like, well, you know, who's, who's winning and who's losing here? Because we control the Congress, we control the Senate, we control the presidency, we control the Supreme Court. And I'm like, yeah, you know, you do kind of have a point there in a particular way. And so there was an appreciation for that. But I will also say that the data I looked at really looks at the mortal consequences of that kind of exchange, which is that particular trade-off for working class white Americans of supporting those policies ends up really functioning from a health level almost like not wearing a seatbelt when you drive or living in a house with asbestos or breathing secondhand smoke. It literally became a disease risk factor and in a way, that's why I called the book Dying of Whiteness is because what happened is when you started to aggregate all of these factors, you know, and think about it, you live in a state, you're a poor working class white person, and you block your own health care, you bring in a lot of guns, which are themselves kind of pathogens in a particular way. It ended up making white life harder, sicker, and shorter to the point where being white became a high risk category over the time of the, my analysis. And the other part of this is that happened while nationalizing some of these policies. And so the policies, I mean, you would think in a, in a, a different kind of <laughs> universe than the one we live in, we would say things like, well, gosh, Kansas um, had terrible outcomes when they cut health care, and Missouri had terrible outcomes when they, uh, uh, education. Missouri had terrible outcomes when they let a lot of guns around. So let's not do what they did there. Instead, let's look at what happened in New York. But instead, what's happening is a lot of these southern state policies in the Trump administration are becoming national policies. So the last point I just want to make is really just about the fantasy. I mean, I think part of the fantasy of government or social programs was that there was an idea where you could have a society in which we gain and they lose. You could create social programs that just benefit white people but don't benefit other people. Now, I'm sure there are you know, slavery and other kinds of social programs you can think of that fit that mold. But when you're talking about things like healthcare, education system, um, things like that, public safety, infrastructure, really we're all connected. And I really came away with an even greater appreciation that systems that rise all boats are better for the country, but systems that are targeted at just you know, not letting them get away with it or them getting, getting away with the system, it might have been a nice fantasy. But it ended up booming, boomeranging and being bad for everybody. And I, of course, get a lot of pushback from a very conservative audiences. And they say, well, this about your data and that about your data. And I say, well, show me one example where letting a lot of guns into a state or blocking health care reform. Give me one example where that's good for people's health, because I think that would be a fair rebuttal. But unfortunately, you know, that's not the analysis that they're doing. They're doing an analysis of this idea of this racialized notion of restored greatness. And really, that really made me think about a bigger system, about who benefits and who loses. And again, really, if people read the book and the end of the book, is really all about how much better we would all be if we create systems that benefit everyone, rather than uh, falling back into what social psychologists call a zero-sum formulation of race, in which we think that there are winners and losers because ultimately it, it just hurts us all. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, that was very interesting and I think a really nice way to kind of put some data to some of these cultural um, observations. Uh, this question is kind of interesting. I wonder how your audience response has varied through the different states where you give this talk. For instance, in your home state, your current home state of Tennessee, I wonder kind of what the what the response is. I really appreciated hearing kind of like your perspective from your friends and acquaintances, but what is the, you know, how have you noticed uh, a difference throughout the country? 
That's a great question because, I've, again, I've, I've spoken to many different kinds of audiences about this research. I've, of course, tried as much as I can to stay in the safe bubble. No, but, uh, but no, I mean, I don't think that this is an argument just, just for that, really. And so I've spoken, I've been on Fox News a bunch. Um, I've spoken to very conservative audiences. I've done a lot of speaking to ministry audiences, very conservative audiences. And I think my biggest test will be next week because I'm going back to Kansas uh, to present a lot of this at a at a very, very conservative education conference where I'll be debating the Tea Party education people. And, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I guess th there's a fantasy that it's like, show people the data and they're gonna just change their minds. Gosh, you know, this thing is bad for my health. I want something that's good for my health. Um, and so part of what I think I've gained uh, over the course of this research is an appreciation, as we talked about a little bit last night, that there are different, there are different value systems that go into this particular moment, right? And so I, as, as we were saying last night, I think it's important to just really think about, uh, that's why I, fo I focus everything I can, even when I talk to conservative audiences about race, because I don't think you can understand the story of why people would vote against their own health care unless you understand the story of race and what, and what race means. And I try as much as possible, as much as possible, to have conversations where we open up conversations about that, not to say you're an idiot because you voted for Trump. Um, many people did. I mean, many people I know very well did. But more to say, you know, tell me about your race politics. What are your fears? What are your anxieties? And as much as I possibly can, I've tried to open up those conversations with some Success, obviously, you know, I, it also brought me like the Nazis and things like that. And so it's been a kind of important up and down focus. The other part of this is the gun debate, right, where um, I speak to a lot of pro-gun groups. I was in Arizona last month um, speaking with a guy from the Goldwater Institute um, who's a libertarian who feels like guns should be everywhere. And as hard as those conversations are, I just really feel, number one, like we need to be having them in a particular way. But also, it's, it's amazing how much more productive the conversations can be when you're not on Twitter, where everybody automatically is programmed to hate each other. So I, I've been, I mean, again, the people who probably hate me, they don't come to my talk. Um, but I will say that I've been encouraged. I mean, talk to me after, last, after next week when I go to Topeka. But I will say that I've been encouraged um, about the kind of conversations that I've had. And I'm also still in touch with a lot of my respondents. Um, and I check in with them. And... You know, I, I guess, you know, they're tired of this assumption that they're going to turn on Trump the minute he does something dumb. That's what they feel like the liberals always think. And so they just want people to think that they had bigger ideals and all, all these kind of things. But it's, it's led to some interesting kinds of conversations. Whether that translates into any electoral kind of change is yet to be seen. Um, the simplest version of my question is, is there anything we can do? Um, but part of that comes from the idea that it, it feels like what you're talking about is really tightly related to capitalism and the idea in our whole country that we um, could be special, that there is such a thing as privilege that is for me and not other people, um, and that we can all pull ourselves up by our bootstraps if we, if we put the hard work into it. Um, so in the culture that we have, is it possible to, to change those things? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, because, you know, we're all, we're all struggling with this, <laughs> with this moment and what to do about it. Um, ran, I ran out of, I'll show you in a second, I ran out of time, so I didn't finish all my slides. Um, but I will say that I think that there's a, there's a tension, right? If you think about the capitalism argument, what's the capitalism argument? The capitalism argument is that um, poor people irregardless of their race or ethnicity, um, are being screwed over by corporations uh, and very wealthy people. And the reason I say that is because um, imagine all these poor conservative people I talked to in the South um, who were willing to lay down on the tracks for this identity, a, a political identity, a racial identity. And so I just kept thinking, um, imagine if these people said, yeah, I'm poor, but in order to, if you want my support as a politician, um, I want better health care. I want better education. I want better roads. And they would push back on the Republican Party. There was a kind of progressive movement. Um, and the fact that they don't do that is what lets the GOP platform stand, right? Because the minute poor people start saying, I want better health care, the GOP doesn't have the money to give tax breaks to very wealthy people and corporations. And so if that's the logic that you can tap into, um, then it's a great moment for progressivism, right? A, a more of a socioeconomic argument. But at the same time, there are tremendous 
tremendous pitfalls to that, and I, I didn't get to any of this stuff, but the pitfall is that there's this whole racial history uh, in the South that the economic argument doesn't take account of at all about who even has the right to have health insurance. Well, it turned out health insurance was a white prerogative. They didn't even have, they had Negro slave insurance. Black people were seen as property in the South. Um, and so even the, uh, this, the, all these tensions, and so if you're not gonna deal with these tensions, I feel like that's, that's the pitfall, are people who against their economic interests are willing to vote for a better thing. And I don't know, I, I, we talked about this a lot last night, and I debate how much progressivism is really struggling with this idea of this racial history, which to me is a much more important thing to talk about. I know we're out of time. Could I just do one more, one more quickie? Uh, gentleman in the back. Uh, um, thanks for the talk, it was great, and last night was great too. Um, how do you interrogate the wage of whiteness uh, without triggering white fragility or um, other defenses that then make conversations about race very hard to, ha very hard to have? Yeah, okay, and there was one more question. Did somebody else have their hand up? Please, uh, yes. Maybe perhaps a justice-informed approach, uh, equality being the same thing for everyone. I guess um, it sounds like equality isn't even something that the people that you spoke with are willing to consider, and so from your perspective, from a, a, a structural standpoint, how do we get to a place where we can have equity discussions? Well, the most, these are kind of the same kind of questions about white fragility, about equity, and for people who can make it through the book, I was teasing people last night because I guess people are listening to it on audiobook, and there's a lot of data and graphs, and so whoever read it is to be like, 0.467, point nine, whatever, so I can't imagine, unless you're like have insomnia or something, uh, listening to that part of the book. Um, but, I, but I will say that at the conclusion of the book, I present who I think are kind of my heroes, and so part of what I want to warn people against doing is overgeneralizing that everybody feels this way. I also met a lot of remarkable people who were Republican politicians uh, in Kansas. I talk about them a lot in the conclusion. Uh, people who were pro-gun conservatives who were also talking about equity and equality and, and were not fragile in, in a particular way. So I felt like there were different models of how to be white in this country. Um, that were not the standard narrative that you hear on Twitter and from Trump, which he plays to, um, which is black and brown people are gonna come take away all your stuff. I mean, that's kind of the narrative. Um, but it's important to note that there are many different models that are generous and, and looking out for different kinds of people and other kinds of things. And so I, I talk about those a lot in the end. Um, and I also talk about how much society benefits. Um, there are all these, econ I mean, all the things that People say they care about, like blocking the Affordable Care Act because it's too expensive. Well, it turns out um, having as many people insured saves money. And having a diversity of opinions in a business place is actually really good for productivity because you get different people approaching things in different ways. Um, having as many people feel like they can buy into the system and rise up from nothing is very good for the economics of a city. And so I just think that those kind of arguments are ones that the Democrats should be making a bit, a bit more loudly uh, than they are right now, to be honest. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll, it, it's to be seen, but I, I think right now, you know, we have this huge, this huge election coming up that I think will determine what, what happens going forward. So thanks so much. Thanks, Dr. Nichols.